has a straight edge on it, so it's very easy. And maybe in our world here, there lives a happy little mountain. everyone welcome back to my channel if you're new here my name is Caitlin I upload a whole bunch of different types of videos on this channel mainly surrounding true crime videos I do unsolved mysteries I do disappearances psychological experiment videos anything along those lines and also a little bit of university and lifestyle videos sprinkled in where I can so today I'm bringing back another uh, true crime case and this is actually day four of my mystery week so if you haven't already seen I'm uploading a true crime video every single day of this week Monday to Sunday so please schedules because I have already got a bunch of videos up and I will be having more up for the rest of the week today we're going to be discussing the actually solved murder of Rachel Nichol and I actually had a load of you requesting this and I think it's because Rachel Nichol was someone that was born kind of near where I'm from so it kind of hits quite close to home and I found it absolutely fascinating when I was reading this. The main reason I wanted to kind of cover this video today was because of the extremely extremely controversial we'll say discussion around um, the method in which police sort of gained their suspects in the the murder of Rachel Nichol. So they in particular they wasted a lot of their time and resources on a man who was ultimately innocent and they didn't really look down any avenues until a lot further down the line so if you want to hear a little bit about this case then keep on watching and uh, we shall just get started rachel jane nickel was born on the 23rd of november 1968 to andrew and monica nickel she grew up in great totem which is just outside of colchester in essex in the uk and then when she was 11 she started studying at the colchester high school for girls which is somewhere very close to where i'm from and um, she had a particular kind of keen interest and talent really in all things performance and theatre related. She had such a talent and such a love for all things kind of theatre, she even began to sort of perform like dance, sing, act, all these sort of things in the Essex Dance Theatre in her spare time. So she was a really really talented girl and she had a really really great passion for the arts. However despite her obvious talents and interest in the performing arts, she actually decided that when she would leave school she wanted to pursue kind of more of a traditionally academic route in life. When she was 18 she began studying for an English and history degree in London. All the while in her spare time she was working part-time as a lifeguard in Richmond in London just to kind of put her way through her uni studies. So she was a really really smart girl and she was so dedicated so to be able to put her way through uni working part-time and still do well in her uni course she was really smart, she was really really motivated and very dedicated at what she was interested in. So it was at her job as a lifeguard that she met her future boyfriend. So his name was Andre Hanscom, I think is how you pronounce it. She was 20 years old when they met and it didn't take long kind of for them to become really really serious. And they ended up moving in together not long after meeting. Uh, in a place called South Ballam in London. And then in the year of 1989, Rachel and Andre welcomed their son Alex into the world. Her focus soon kind of shifted from her academics to Alex, understandably, because she was 20 years old, she had an infant son, and it was kind of through Alex that she discovered a new love of hers that kind of brought in this old talent of performing arts from when she was younger. So while Alex was still an infant, she kind of discovered this love again of performing and she wanted to pursue a career in children's TV presenting. So she wanted to kind of combine two aspects of her life that she loved the most and being a TV presenter for a children's show seemed like the perfect fit for her. And life at this point for all three of the families seemed really, really good. They were happy, they had a newborn child, they were really in love, they were kind of happy with where they were in life. And like I said, Rachel was kind of picking up this new dream of hers. So it was all seemingly really, really good and happy for them, but sadly this is where things took quite a dark turn. On the 15th of July, 1992, Rachel, who was 23 years old, and Alex, who was just about to turn three years old at the time, decided to go on a walk like they kind of typically did. They decided to go out on this route that they had taken a lot of times before. So 
it was a particularly popular route, uh, especially in the morning times for people walking their dogs, for mothers and their children. It was kind of, like I said, it was a known route. It was a lovely little walk around Wimbledon Common and they actually decided to take their Labrador named Molly with them on this kind of mild summer's morning walk. However, despite the fact that it was a particularly kind of popular and busy path at that time in the morning that they decided to leave, sadly, for some reason, their attacker had selected Rachel and Alex to be the victim of his attack and it was around 10 20 a.m that without them knowing it the pair had already been kind of chosen by their attacker and they were being stalked through this pathway that they didn't know so the pair were walking along this familiar route this familiar pathway when a strange man appeared out of nowhere in amongst the trees and began threatening them with a knife now this attack was quick it was particularly kind of frantic and frenzied and violent it was all over very very quickly for Rachel so first the attacker went for Alex the three-year-old infant so he kind of grabbed at Alex who had been being held by Rachel um, and he kind of threw Alex to the ground as a means of just getting him away from Rachel who was obviously the intended victim of his attack and from here once Alex was kind of out of the way he went on to attack Rachel um, he sexually violated her he actually stabbed her and ultimately ended her life in total, Rachel was stabbed 49 times during the attack and one of them in particular had ended her life and coroners actually kind of later on when they examined her body said that the attacker had used such force when he'd slit her throat in particular that he nearly decapitated her. So that will show you kind of how frenzied and frantic this attack was. And sadly, all the while this was happening, three-year-old Alex was, well, he could do nothing but watch his mother die once all this was over the attacker just kind of ran off sped off like i said it was a very very quick frantic attack and then before long a woman walked down this pathway this happened to walk down this pathway when she came across rachel's body lying underneath a tree and alex covered in his mother's blood just sat next to her because he hadn't even turned three yet so obviously the poor young boy he could do nothing but wait with his mother as you can imagine, it didn't take long for police officers to respond to this phone call that this woman had placed saying that she'd found this body um, in Wimbledon Common. And before long, the entire area was surrounded by law enforcement officers. People were being questioned, but obviously from the, um, on the investigator's point of view, there were over 500 people there, which means that not only their suspect pool, but also their potential witness pool had become so massive. There were 500 plus people that they had to individually question, let alone anyone that had managed to slip out before they had arrived on scene. So like I said at the start of the video, their first suspect in the investigation into Rachel's murder would be one that took up so much of their time and resources that it kind of prevented them from seeing what actually had happened that day. So in order for me to kind of explain this, I'm going to go into this suspect and what he had been doing that day and why he kind of came across the radar of the police investigators at the time. This man's name was Colin Stagg and uh, he was a 31 year old man. He was living in Roehampton, which is also in London at the time of the attack. Stagg had what he claimed to be kind of his daily routine he said it was a particularly active person and he also had a young dog so he every day liked to have this routine where he could not only kind of go out for a walk for his own health benefits but obviously also take his dog out for a walk so he said that every morning he would wake up and go to a pond or a lake that was quite close to his house do a lap of it and return home again with his dog however on the morning of july the 15th colin said that he'd woken up with a particularly nasty headache and so his morning kind of started off a bit slower than it usually did so he headed out that morning on his usual route with his dog to a place called Sio Skio Pond. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that word. But because this headache was particularly kind of nasty and it kept coming back, he decided to cut his walk short. He didn't do the complete route that he'd done and returned home early. So he managed to make it home at about 9.25 a.m. just to kind of sleep off the headache, hopefully. Now, what I would point out is that this pond that he would typically walk to is actually a part of Wimbledon Common, which is obviously um, where the attack took place kind of later on in the day. After he'd slept off this headache, he woke up and decided that he would take his dog out for a walk again because, like I said, he was particularly kind of health conscious and aware of looking after his dog. He'd had to cut his walk short that morning. So he decided that, if anything, the fresh air would do him good with his headache after he'd slept off most of the pain. So he decided to head out again on the walk with the dog 
um, just to kind of complete it. Colin was completely unaware of the attack that was taking place in, in, in Wimbledon Common that morning. So he set out again on this walk. His route took him on an underpass through something called the Putney Vale Cemetery, which is where he then came across a uniformed police officer who told him that he couldn't walk any further into Wimbledon Common because the body of a woman had been discovered. Colin thinking that he was being kind of helpful or like, I don't know, potentially saying that I can help if you need me. He offered his name and address and said that early that morning he had already been in Wimbledon Common walking his dog. So he hadn't seen anything then, kind of hoping that he could provide a little bit more of like a timeline. And so because he couldn't continue this walk, he decided to just take his dog, turn around and walk back home again. Sadly, what he wasn't aware of was the fact that because he had offered this information to this uniformed police officer, he would soon become a suspect. And people have kind of speculated why they thought that he had something to do with this attack. A lot of people think it was just because obviously this, this officer saw him with his dog walking into Wimbledon Common and then for Colin to then say, oh, I have been in Wimbledon Common this morning with this dog. I guess it kind of could seem a little bit strange, but when you hear that sort of story, what had happened this morning, it does make sense. So sadly, without him knowing, he became quite um, a high up suspect in the attack of Rachel Nichol. So investigators focused on Stag for many months of the investigation because they were adamant that he wasn't telling the truth about why he had been in that area two times that same morning. But unfortunately, because the investigation was focusing on Stag, they were completely unaware or they didn't kind of notice a series of attacks that had happened not only before the attack of Rachel Nichol, but following the attack of Rachel Nichol that were ultimately linked. So I've been kind of trying to work out how to talk through this case. And I'm sorry if it's a little bit jumpy. It isn't as sort of straightforward as a lot of cases are because the next thing I kind of have to jump a little bit forward it's all a bit all over the place. So I'm gonna try my best to explain it. I'm really sorry if it gets a little bit confusing. So now we're gonna go on to the actual attacker and his sort of timeline. They will link at some point. So I know it seems a bit jumpy, but I will have a link between everything. It will be explained. So now we're gonna focus on the attacker. The attacker's name is Robert Clive Napper. And in the year of 1989, he actually had confessed to his mother of a number of attacks that he had committed in kind of recent years, mostly sexually related attacks. They weren't murders, but because he'd confessed this to his mother, um, she obviously panicked and called the police on her son. So when police were looking into the attack of Rachel Nichol, they didn't see this link between this local man and his attacks and the attack of Rachel Nichol. Robert Napa grew up with Asperger's. He had a number of problems, like he proved to be quite a difficult child throughout early years and throughout the years he'd been sent by family members to a number of psychiatrists who all kind of sent him back saying that he was a danger to everyone, that he was mad, one even said. So obviously he was kind of a red flag in that sort of sense, but no one can really predict what they're going to do necessarily. As it turns out, Robert Napper would become a sexually motivated serial killer who had ultimately been nicknamed the Green Chain Walk Killer because of the location of his attacks that would uh, soon take place. So his first attack took place in the summer of 1989, which is the same year that he confessed to his mother. So the first attack that he confessed to uh, happened earlier on in the year. It took place in a place called Plumstead in London. So a woman had been inside her own home. She'd been getting her kids ready for school in the morning when she dried her hair. She was drying her hair with a blow dryer and she left the back door open just to get some air into the house. Next thing she knows, she kind of turns off the hair dryer, turns around and there's a man there holding a blade, threatening her and her children. He threatened that if any of them didn't comply with his demands, he would kill them all and he then proceeded to attack this woman. Then on the 10th of March, 1992, Robert Napper attempts to sexually assault a young girl, but she manages to get away with her life and she runs away being able to kind of describe her attacker, but they still haven't been able to identify him. Then eight days later on the 18th of March, Napper attacks another young girl uh, with a sexual motive and he this time threatens her with a knife because obviously the last one had managed to get away so he kind of upped his aggressiveness. And then in May of 1992, he attacked a 22 year old mother um, who was with her two year old daughter in a location that was very, very close to where he would attack Rachel Nichol. 
and he sexually assaults the mother in broad daylight. Then on the 15th of July 1992, this is when Napa attacks Rachel Nichol. And then it wasn't until August of 1993, so the following year, that he kind of became a red flag in the police system because a complaint was placed against him by a young couple who claimed that they had seen him spying on a young girl in her flat. So he had been watching her through her window and they'd kind of seen him doing it. So they filed the complaint and he was brought in for questioning. The person who had questioned him had noted down in his file, and I quote, he was extremely strange and a possible rapist, but they don't arrest him. And then by September of 1993, the investigators focus was still on Colin Stagg as being the perpetrator of Rachel Nichols attack. So this was when they actually first arrested him. I'm gonna go into a little bit about this. I know it's all kind of quite jumpy. So I hope you're kind of following me at this point. So in order to arrest Colin Stagg, investigators kind of put in place this really, really controversial method, which has since been really, really disputed. Investigators used a honey trap method in which they kind of had an undercover police or a female police investigator as a potential victim. So she kind of put herself in this situation and attempted to kind of encourage him to attack her in a way. So the honey trap method involved a female police officer who used the name Lizzie James to contact him. She had this relationship kind of building with Colin Stagg over about five months. They contacted each other through writing letters to one another and the letters became kind of more and more sexually explicit I guess on behalf of this woman known as Lizzie James. They ultimately ended in her kind of demanding that he confess to the murder of Rachel Nichol and then in return for him confessing she would or well, she promised him sex which obviously she wasn't actually going to do because like I said she was an undercover police officer but it was this honey trap method where they were hoping to catch him in this confession. She even actually went as far to tape herself saying that she fantasized about a man threatening her with a knife in a kind of sexual context and she sent this tape to him in hopes of prompting this confession. However, despite the fact that he was just as much involved in this relationship because he, he wasn't aware obviously of this whole honey trap method, um, he still didn't confess. He said that he had nothing to do with it and he wasn't going to pretend that he had anything to do with it. However, because of the nature of this, like the, the conversation they'd been having, they still managed to arrest him because I think they kind of looked for any little thing they could that could potentially even remotely link to the attack of Rachel Nichol and they arrest Colin Stagg despite the fact that he maintained innocence. So this arrest was obviously very, very unethical and there was nothing conclusive even remotely from from the, the, the evidence that they gained from this. It's I'll go into later but it was ultimately so, so unethical. And then on the 3rd of November 1993, Robert Napper rapes and murders a woman named Samantha Bissett and also murders her four-year-old daughter named Jasmine during the attack. So bear in mind this happens while they've got Colin Stagg in custody convinced that he was the perpetrator of this attack. Then in May of 1994 the kind of police became more and more aware of Robert Napper. He became more of a red flag when more and more complaints came forward claiming that he was spying on women, people were worried that they were going to attack him, so he became very very known in the investigators eyes and there was ended up putting police surveillance on him because they had no other way to kind of conclusively say what he was doing. And Colin Stagg's trial after his arrest took place around the same time as this, which is ultimately when the judge deemed the evidence of the honey trap method as being inadmissible because it was too deceptive and it wasn't really anything conclusive. It didn't provide anything that could lead to his conviction. And because of this, their case kind of against Colin Stagg completely fell apart. But while this is happening, they still were unaware of the links between all of these crimes and Robert Napper. And then everything kind of went quiet from here until, it wasn't until 2004 actually, that Robert Napper even became a potential suspect in, in any of these attacks. So in 2004, there was kind of an extreme advancement in DNA testing. So in 2004 they re-examined the Rachel Nichol case because obviously up until now it had been closed for maybe a decade. So um, they managed to finally link some DNA that they found in the original case file to Robert Napper and he ultimately was found guilty of Rachel Nichols murder. However at this point 
Robert Knapper was already serving time in Broadmoor Hospital, which is quite an infamous hospital. I'm sure a lot of you will have heard of it. Um, so he was already serving time in Broadmoor Hospital for paranoid schizophrenia. And this diagnosis had come after he had been found guilty of the murder of Samantha Bissett and her four-year-old daughter. So he, at this point, had already been convicted of one, well, two murders, sent to a secure mental health facility. And then they discovered that he had been the perpetrator of all of these attacks that I've mentioned. And then it wasn't until four years after they had matched him through DNA testing to the attack of Rachel Nichol that he confessed. So in 2008, Robert Napper confessed to the murder of Rachel Nichol and a number of other cases or well, attacks that he'd carried out. But like I said, he was already incarcerated at this point. So that is everything. Um, I've kind of, it was, I know it was a little bit jumbled because it's hard to sort of just talk about Rachel Nichols' case without going into details about Robert Napper and all of his other attacks. So I hope this kind of wasn't too confusing for you. But yeah, that was kind of everything. I always, in a sense, I don't like talking about these, but it brings me some um, kind of peace knowing that the perpetrator of such horrible attacks is put away and I always say this about similar cases but sadly it is such a shame that it took police investigators so long to get the right man in custody which I think is absolutely crazy there's a lot of discussion online about whether people think that there was a cover-up or whether it was just police ignorance but the question is how could they be so ignorant and unaware of Robert Napper and be so adamant that Colin Stagg a completely innocent man had perpetrated this act so I yeah, there's a lot on that. Let me know your thoughts down below. I'm sure a lot of you kind of share my thoughts on this. Um, and also let me know any other cases you want me to discuss in future week's videos. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting. And I'll see you tomorrow for another instalment of True Crime Week. Bye.